welcome to Kino Society. With Owen Shapiro. Welcome to Kino Society. In today's episode, we have Michael Berger. Michael has spanked 4,000 hours of TV, hosting seven television shows across all networks, including ABC's Mike and Maddie, Iron Chef USA, and the iconic game show Match Game. Welcome to Kino Society. Thank you. Nice to be here, Owen. How are you? Good, good. You? All good. What made you want to host television series? <laughs> well, I didn't really know I wanted to do that. I just knew I kind of liked the sound of laughter, and uh, I liked the ability to communicate with somebody, really not perfecting that until I certainly got older. But I was the guy in the classroom that would pipe up and say something and get a laugh, and I thought, well, this is nice. And then at some point I realized, oh, you could get paid to do it. So you started off as just a comedian, but what made you want to host television series, though? Well, you know, it was a natural progression. So started out doing stand-up, cruise ships initially, and the idea of hosting really uh, fit me, fit my personality. As you, as you know, you've done enough interviews now, the idea of chatting with somebody and bringing them out and seeing where that goes, as opposed to acting where it's scripted, I loved the other side of it a conversation with somebody and then game shows were a perfect format. And then obviously talk shows refined that. So that from an early, early on moment for me was, was the direction I wanted to go. I knew hosting more than anything, more than stand up, certainly acting um, was never on my radar. It was the idea of hosting that I said, this is something I can do for a living. So, would you say that you prefer more improvised comedy or doing more improvised comedy than scripted? Sure. The, any great comedy is built on structure, and within that structure, you can improv. So when I, when I did stand-up, that was pretty scripted, but there'd be moments where you would play with the audience, which would let you run for a while and see where it goes. Part of my career where I did sitcom warm-up, which we can talk about if you wish, uh, would involve me standing in front of a live studio audience for the five hours it would take to shoot 22 minutes. <laughs> and and you, certainly, you certainly run out of material in that scenario. But what fills that gap and what fuels that creativity is the improving with the audience and, of course, the actors. And then it takes on a life of its own. You didn't attend any sort of university or school for this. Sure. Well, not for that. But all of my schooling for me was just another excuse to work in front of an audience, which happened to be my classmates or a teacher that would have to put up with it. So elementary school, junior high school, I quickly learned how to get a laugh in class or attempt a laugh. I certainly had a built-in respect for the teachers, and then I, I have was raised by a family of teachers, mom, dad, aunts and uncles all taught. So I had the respect for them. So you figured out where the boundaries were, what you could get away with without getting in trouble and yet still move the class along. If, if I thought things were dull, I would take it upon myself to take the uh, classroom in a different direction. So there is no formal training other than I, I did major in communications. I was a radio TV communications major in college and graduated with that degree. But nothing really prepares you for the real world of, of that industry. So other than just being funny, what other talents and skills are required for the job? For the job of hosting? Well, yeah, just being a television host or generally doing stand-up comedy. Well, there's two very different avenues in that. In, in stand-up, you observe something that perhaps strikes you funny, and then you refine that and share that with an audience, and hopefully they see it the same way you do. It's, it's seeing the world a little askew, or perhaps saying something someone has thought but just hasn't articulated. In the world of stand-up, it's highly prepared and polished, except for those moments, like I said, where you can go play with an audience and ad-lib and improv. But you take somebody like Jerry Seinfeld, who's a master at the economy of the, of the word, of the phrase, he'll hone... He'll hone a joke until 
it's down to the bare minimum with words to get the laugh he wants. Hosting is a whole nother muscle. To be a great host, you got to you got to show interest in someone else. It's not about you. It's about them. So that idea of making someone else look good for that person having their moment, whether you are on a talk show or on a game show, is the secret to a successful interview and a, and a good host. And there are masters out there that did that successfully, like a Johnny Carson, who was probably the best at it. So that's a skill that I continually work on. It's one that I uh, never gets old. And when I go out and speak in the corporate world and I speak to executives and leadership teams on how to motivate employees and how to get buy-in from their team members, that skill, I actually say to them, you should behave like a talk show host because talk show hosts are trained to show interest in other people. That's the that's the quickest way to being a good host is make it about someone else. In terms of your hosting career, what's an average workday like for you? <laughs> well, it really depends on the job. In the world of game shows, have, have you ever attended a, a game show taping? I do not believe so, no. Well, you'd know it if you did because they're, they're long. Uh, when I shot Match Game, we shot seven episodes a day. Now, game shows run pretty true to time. You have a fixed amount of questions. There's an answer. There's a win. There's a loss. There's a bonus round. There's goodbye. So you can cram quite a few of those shows, a show like Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune to this day, and Match Game when I did it back in the day. We shot seven. We'd do three, take a lunch break, and then do four more with a separate audience. So two audiences, seven shows. And we do that three days in a row. They get 21 shows in the can. And then you'd take two weeks off to produce the next batch of shows, meaning finding more contestants, writing new questions, tweaking, and then you do it all over again. So when we shot Match Game, we did 135 episodes in a couple of months. Oh, that's quite a lot, actually. That's right. Yeah. So it adds up. When I did talk shows, I did Mike and Maddie. We did 535 episodes. I did Home and Family. I did 1,000 hours with that. That was two hours live a day. So the preparation <laughs> was a good night's sleep and being alert in the morning. Uh, and I'm being halfway facetious because you, if you had an author, you'd try to get you try to get caught up on their book. If you're interviewing an actor. For me personally, I'd like to do a little research so I knew who I'm talking to. And then also just being in the moment. Uh, there are so many examples of interviews that went off script, if you would. I, for those curious about how a talk show unfolds, a guest would be pre-interviewed the night before. Uh, literally, a producer would call them up and say, what would you like to talk about? And they would hone this six to seven to eight minute interview. And they would work in that a movie they want to promote, a, a book, uh, whatever their story was. And then the producer of that segment would stand behind the camera with cue cards, with bullet points, getting you to really kind of spit out what was already asked. Some of the greatest interviews that I was lucky to be a part of were interviews that went beyond that. They they went from a question that was written to one that was that was improvised. It was it came off it the the actor's mind to go another way. And so we went that way. And that's where it really gets fun. And that comes it comes down to listening. Which which way are we going to take this? Some actors are comfortable with that. Uh, others aren't. Others want to kind of stick to the copy. What would you say is the most difficult thing about your career? I think many would say uh, getting the opportunity to work more. You know, I've been lucky enough to have a nice run. And at this point, I get to do some fun stuff that I choose to do. But very few of us would, would get that long run, like a Bob Barker for 30 years on The Price, or like I said, Johnny, or Letterman. A show that runs 10, 20, 30 years is the anomaly. I don't know if you know the statistics, but... The union that we belong to, Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA, there are 185,000 members of that union. At any given moment, 
there's an 85% unemployment rate. And of the 15% that are lucky enough to work, 1% make 100 grand a year or more. So the odds are stacked against you. See, you've got to be in this for the right reasons. So the challenge for most actors or hosts is to, is to keep to keep working. So that's why you find other avenues. And in, in my case, speaking on the corporate circuit has certainly filled that void for me in a way that I can get my stand up in and I can still get the fun of the audience. So you mentioned how there are many people that have the same career or aspire to have the same career that you do. So how do you think you were able to stand apart from the rest? Well, I think my career is pretty unique. There, I don't think there are many that have been lucky enough to have my career. So seven shows is a pretty nice uh, bit of luck. The There are stand-ups who will just do stand-up from day one to till they're done. Um, I never got into the sitcom world as an actor, but I certainly hung around that long enough doing sitcom warm-up. And I think to remain successful or necessary in the business, you got to do a couple things. You you got to do your homework. <laughs> you got to show up on time. You got to be somebody that others want to hang out with. It's it's really not that difficult. Just be nice to people on the way up, on the way down. And keep innovating. Keep inventing. Keep honing your craft. Again, it's another message, both whether you're in broadcasting or any line of work. Uh, you got to adapt. You got to you got to keep uh, leveraging into what the public is telling you. A buddy of mine that I wrote my first book with, Ross Schaefer, has got the greatest line about adapting, and it's this: If you don't like change, you're probably going to hate extinction. And I think that's an overlay for any business. From what I've said so far, does any of that resonate with you? Have you found in your line of work, have you found interviewing people that – is it different than what you thought? Do you do you find yourself continually working at that process? Is it as easy or is it more difficult? Yeah, it's it gets slightly easier each time, I'd say, because at the same time, it's, it's challenging to think up questions while people are talking. And, <laughs> well, you're not you're not supposed to think about questions while they're talking. You're supposed to be listening to them. That's the, that's the fun part because it'll take you in a completely different direction. I I notice in your background that you you're a cinephile and you you I get the feeling that you love everything about this business, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that I think that interest in that industry, the interest you have in these people that you interview, were obviously the key to your key to success and to keep you um i guess keep you engaged i assume you're not burnt out yet right you're still having fun with this yeah i'm not, I'm not burnt out at all yeah yeah um but like any profession well i should just speak for me uh i love the challenge of something new uh, again on the corporate market when somebody comes to me and wants me to speak to the group i deep dive and find out everything there is to know about that company i just spoke to the National Association of Automobile Dealers, and I'm a car guy, so I learned everything there is to know about that world of cars and selling it, and that to me was so interesting. So my job changes whether I'm doing a commercial or whether it's uh, lucky enough to be part of a television show. I think the newness of it and not knowing what's coming for me is what keeps it fresh, keeps it fun. So, yeah, you also mentioned that you had other careers like with cars and real estate. Do you think that helps your entertainment career at all? Well, let's see. The cars have been a passion. That's just pure indulgement. That's just fun. So uh, I would collect and restore and sell and and have some fun with that. Not on the scale of a Jay Leto or a Seinfeld, but in my own world, I've always loved cars had fun doing that. The real estate world, I kind of was forced into when I first started in this business, whether it's telling jokes or wanting to be a host. My dad said, son, you need a backup plan. I said, well, I, I, I want to do what I'm doing. He goes, yeah, I know you do, but you need a backup plan. 
well, I don't want to be distracted. I, I kind of like this showbiz. Yeah, I know you do, but you need a backup plan. But oh, all right, what do I do? Go get your real estate license. So I got my real estate license and didn't do anything with it for decades because I really wanted this other career. And as it turns out, my dad was right. When, when I had more free time than I knew what to do with, I started flipping homes. And I think to your question, there is an overlay between the world of real estate and then the world of broadcasting and television and hosting. Because again, it's about the client. It's about the other person. It's quite a bit of creativity in selling or flipping a home. There's a there's attention to detail, and there is trying to figure out what that buyer needs or wants. So, I think they dovetail nicely. Again, it's about it's about the person you're dealing with. I've got a friend of mine that started in the real estate business when I did, and she's still in it. She had no designs on getting in any other profession like I did. And I, I think her career is fascinating because she never feels she's successful, yet she is. She always feels she has to keep working at it. She thinks it, it can go away in a heartbeat. And yet, um, we were just talking about this the other day because the real estate market has exploded. And I said, do you get the feeling that if you backed off your advertising or your marketing, that people would not use you anymore as an agent? She said, well, she goes, when I do occasionally back off to kind of get that work life balance. She goes, my reputation keeps me top of mind for a while. So I think the longer you stay in the business, whether it's the one I'm in, or the one she's in, if you treat people nicely, if you're good at what you do and you're consistent, then you're going to stick around. You're not interested in staying in one business though, right? You like to hop around between industries. It's sort of the, the, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. So I I do kind of like the variety of it. But if you're asking me, would I like to host a game show for the next 15, 20 years? I'd say, yeah, sure. I'm not not doing this because someone hasn't asked. When I did Match Game, we did a year and a half. I, I could have done that. Uh, I'd be doing it today if they still wanted us. We we were a syndicated show, meaning you went on in different markets at different times. So in some cities, we were opposite Oprah, which was not helpful. <laughs> when we did the morning talk show, we were an ABC show. And when ABC was bought out, we were a victim of that. So I've done some shows that could have run, but circumstances out of our control, like everybody has a story about their show coming and going. But a long-winded way to answer your question is, sure, if it's a fun show, you, nobody wants to quit it. You you want to keep doing it. I've, I've had a blast with the shows I'm lucky enough to host. A while back, you mentioned that you wanted to host and do comedy for a long time. So any particular influences on that? Yeah, I'm of that age group where I would stay up to watch Johnny Carson and I would stay up to see Don Rickles and I would stay up to see Jonathan Winters. Are you familiar with Jonathan Winters? Sounds familiar. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Well, he's he's the most respected comedian ever to stand on stage. He was the greatest improv. Robin Williams idolized Jonathan Winters. So idolizing Jonathan Winters and then getting a chance to work with him on a sitcom where I was doing the sitcom warm up and he was the actor. I got to meet him for the first time and ad lib with him. And I, I you know, I, I don't know how to describe it other than, you know, if you're a baseball fan, it's like taking a, taking a pitch from Kershaw. If you're a NASCAR fan, it's like driving the circuit with Kyle Busch or Richard Petty. It's the best of the best of the best. So I get to meet him. And we do 26 episodes together. And then when Mike and Maddie, my ABC talk show, hit the air, I got a chance to interview him. And he used to come on The Tonight Show and bring a box of hats. And Johnny would give him a hat and Jonathan Winters would put the hat on and just ad lib a character. So cut to, it must have been 15 years since that happened. He sits down. And I give him a box of hats and we create that moment all over again. And it's surreal to think that I'm now sitting where Johnny sat doing this with a guy that I so respected. It's one of those moments you'll never forget for me in the business. You know, when I first started doing talk shows, I couldn't believe that we had to finish in like six minutes. 
in a talk show scenario, you get six to seven minutes. That's the length of a segment. And then they go to commercial. And I thought, well, how in the world am I going to talk to somebody for seven minutes? I, I, I have too much to ask. And you, you, you start training yourself to be concise. And again, that person has been pre-interviewed. So all of those answers are already there. So you can kind of follow a roadmap. But as I was saying before, the fun of it is taking it in a different direction. Robert Goulet, who was one of the all-time great singers, Broadway stars, was on our show. And they had pre-interviewed him the night before and had an arc of questions. And during the interview, he goes off the script and he's talking about his relationship with his dad. Now, the producer that had interviewed him is waving this cue card for me to catch and, and notice the questions that I haven't asked yet. What she was missing was this powerful story that Robert Goulet felt comfortable enough to tell, which was on his father's deathbed, he brought his son close to him and whispered in his ear, son, you're meant to sing, do that. I mean, it was, I got chill. I got chills thinking about it now. And this line producer didn't hear that because she was so concerned that the question wasn't asked that was posed in the pre-interview. So that's a perfect example of a line of questions that come up organically out of that conversation, which to me is just, it's so interesting where people will sometimes take a conversation. But in a, in a world of a talk show, you have a finite amount of time. You just can't sit there for hours and chat. They have a show to produce. You know, we'd have you know, 12 segments sometimes over the course of an hour. They got to stay on time and still make it interesting and still find a way to get something out of someone. Yeah, I, I definitely understand that. I mean, the challenge of being on point, right, and ending, if you said to me, right now, we have to end in five minutes, and you had all these other things to ask, you'd really have to start making some choices on what what would work in that finite amount of time. So for me, when I started out, I thought, well, this, I don't, how, this seems, this is tough. I mean, how do you pull that off? And of course, you pull it off by, you know, people helping you and people, you know, doing these pre-interviews, and you, you start to trust that, oh, the process works. So what's your favorite thing that you've been in? Well, um, with respect to what? In television, I'd say. Well, yeah, because they all, there's so many facets of, a, of one's career that all have their fun. You know, hosting Match Game, I'm literally on the stage that they would tape The Price is Right on. And I was literally in the dressing room where Bob Barker would get dressed. It was It was his dressing room, his stage. And then when they weren't taping, we would come in. So I was I was on hollow ground there. So that was pretty unique. At the end of a taping, a buddy of mine who was the announcer and I would walk into the parking lot and we'd look at that CBS logo and think, you know, we're leaving the dream here. This is, uh, you know, you never want this to end. So that was pretty heady stuff. Um, the talk show format was great because you got to meet some of your idols, like I said. Or I've met presidents. I've met people that. Uh, you know, got to know and become friends with some actors that you never want to meet again and others you couldn't get enough of. The world of stand-up, when I first started out doing stand-up comedy on cruise ships, I thought was the biggest deal in the world because all of a sudden I have an audience that's sitting there and they're listening <laughs> and there was a band behind that would play you on and there were dancers that opened the show and usually a singer that would come on after and then they would bring out the comedian. I couldn't believe that I was in showbiz. In reality, I was just on a boat going down to Mexico and back. But to me, it felt like, you know, I've, I've done something with my career. As small scale as it was, you know, it was, that was probably the, that moment where you feel, oh, man, I guess at the moment I've made the right career choice. We'll see where it goes. So it's about time to wrap things up, actually, speaking of as we said before, like with you saying that often it talk shows are cut short, but yeah, we're also on a time limit here, though much looser time limit. So what would you say to someone who wants to enter the world of television? 
Well, you know, uh, it's it's really got to be something that you you're doing for yourself that you have a a, a skill that you think fits that craft that world because i i think they're in the world of instant celebrity that we have now you could post a youtube video or a tiktok video and all of a sudden you're famous for a moment so the world of showbiz has been blurred by access to being on the air or on someone's phone but that's not acting that's not a career that's a tiktok moment so you have to decide you know, what would you like to do? You know, if, you, if you'd like to be an actor, then in the same way a, a doctor would study to become a doctor, you'd do the same thing. You'd take acting lessons and you'd work at your craft. And if that's something that moves you and you, you feel it's you being the best you could be, to coin a phrase, then, then I say go do it. But don't think that it's something you just fall into or it just happens because – like any successful person, they, they put the work in. And it's, it's gratifying if it works, but just know that don't, don't do it to be famous. Don't do it to make the money. Do it because you love to do it. How can my listeners find and connect with you? Well, uh, if you go to michaelberger.com, so literally my name, uh, I've got a site there where I kind of keep people posted on what's up. And as I said, I'm I work a lot more now in the corporate world, so a company will hire me to come in and and consult and entertain and do that. And then the television stuff is all in the back burner. So I may or may not be back on the air uh, sooner than later. You, it, the stuff you never talk about until it actually happens. So uh, I have got nothing to <laughs> direct them to at the moment as far as broadcast, but um, I pop up here and there, Owen. Thank you so much for being here today. And also thank you for your advice. It's very, very helpful. Oh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm always uh, impressed and uh, hopefully encouraging to people that, that have a passion for it. And clearly you do. And that love for it, I think the love, it, love for it will keep you engaged and hopefully you're having fun with it. And I certainly wish you the, the best and uh, keep doing it for that reason. Keep doing it because you love it. Yeah, thanks. And don't that's all for today. Don't forget you can subscribe to Kino Society on iTunes and Spotify. Have a good afternoon, Owen. Thanks. Nice chatting with you. Mm-hmm.